Hey everyone, welcome to our uh, third install installment of the Simple Numbers webinar series. Um, I really appreciate you all um, taking your time to uh, listen to Debbie Albert discuss business communications today. Um, one of the things when I started doing this was uh, being able to open up more general business conversations with many of our clients, colleagues, peers, um, people who follow, you know, our simple numbers, and uh, really give a, a platform to some of the other um, issues we all face, whether it's business communications or cybersecurity or, you know, the four decisions like our last webinar. And uh, today, you know, it was it would actually worked out um, well. I didn't plan on it, but you know, most states. Um, the country as a whole are starting to talk about opening back up um, in light of the pandemic. And so Debbie today will definitely highlight the importance of communication during this time to employees and to customers that uh, that are going to be asking those questions and, and wanting a plan. And, and, you know, you might have some media considerations in there depending on your business and industry. And so these are all important topics that we want to be able to cover. Um, just a heads up, um, our next webinar series, um, we're going to get jump back over to financials a little bit. Um, I plan on having Brandon Gray, one of our partners and senior consultants present. Um, so stay tuned on the email coming out for that one. Um, but with that being said, uh, I want to introduce Debbie Albert. She is an award winning communications executive with an extensive experience in corporate and employee communications, crisis and issues management, press and media relations. With almost three decades of journalism and communications experience that took her from the White House to North Philadelphia in 2011, she founded Albert Communications and serves as a corporate communications consultant for companies and organizations around the world. For 15 years, Debbie was the Associate VP of Corporate Communications at Aramark, then a $13 billion global food services corporation. During her tenure, she and her team handled the internal and external communications efforts for the company in 22 countries around the world. With a degree in journalism from the George Washington University, she has extensive experience in television news, having worked on the assignment desk at Independent Networks and CNN in Washington, DC, as well as uh, 6 ABC um, and KYW TV in Philadelphia. From 89 to 92, she was a public relations manager at the Spectrum. Following her stint at Spectrum, Debbie handled all public relations marketing functions for an association management company based in Southern New Jersey, serving as the spokesperson for 12 different manufacturing trade groups, ranging from baby product and baseball card manufacturers to the pen and pencil, children's clothing, and waterbed industries. In 2018, she started a podcast called Prove It, featuring 10-minute episodes about trends in marketing and communications. Outside her day job, Debbie runs a nonprofit, Guess Who's Coming to Shabazz, founded in 2012 in memory of her father. The movement focuses on increasing engagement in synagogues and Jewish organizations, has been activated, activated in over 70 congregations throughout North America. She is also the president of the board of directors for Camp Ramah in the Poconos, a $6 million nonprofit. A native Philadelphian, she currently lives in Fort Washington, PA. And I am also a native Pennsylvanian um, and uh, all the way from Erie, PA, another, another world compared to the Philadelphia area. So uh, Debbie, without further ado, take it away. Okay. <laughs> Good. To, I appreciate that intro, Mike. It makes me sound like I'm 400 years old. Um, I could talk about crisis communications for hours and hours and hours, but I won't, I promise. I know all of us have been webinared out. So um, I want to talk about now what's happening and why communications is more critical now than it's ever been before. So I'm going to cover the macro look at crisis communications, then internal communications, then external communications, handling the media, which is really crucial. And then the best part, communications for reopening and key takeaways all while leaving time for questions. So let's get started. So I wanna start first with the big picture. And I start out by saying leadership matters because in times of crisis, leadership does matter. We're just human beings. And the natural first question when there's any kind of change is what about me? 
People want to know they're safe. People want reassurance from those they report to. And people want to hear uncertainty acknowledged. They also want to know that leadership is thinking ahead because this too shall pass. But it's really important that you understand your audience. So when it's time to communicate, the first question I always ask is, who are you communicating with? Is it your warehouse workers or your corporate white collar workers? Are you talking to your board of directors or your donors? Are you talking directly to your customers or your clients? Each audience may need to be communicated with in slightly different ways, with slightly different language and a different tone. But remember, the first question everyone has is what about me? So take their reading level into account and even consider the different languages they may use in your team. Messaging. And once we understand who the audiences are, we move on to messaging. This builds the foundation of everything which will follow in communications. It's like building the foundation of your house first. I'm working with someone now who calls them Legos. We draft the messages or create the Lego pieces and we keep building on them, taking into account all the audiences and focusing on what our main messages are. Once those are approved by everyone on the team, we build on the Legos, we build on the foundation as needed. Which brings me to frequency and consistent consistency and tone. People want to hear from their leaders, uh, but you need to consider what they want to hear, what they need to hear, and how often they need to hear it. If you or your leadership haven't communicated yet, or don't really have an established voice by now during this pandemic, I'm sorry to say that you're already far behind. But my guess is that most of you on this call are already communicating. And it's really important that the voice, and I'm using air quotes, the voice of the company, the voice of the leadership, be consistent in its tone and its frequency. I'd also argue that candor, transparency, and empathy are really crucial today. Let's admit it, this entire situation is getting old fast. Leaders who exhibit empathy are more trusted and more appreciated than do those who don't. We're all suffering in different ways, so make sure the voice of your company doesn't sound arrogant or uncaring. I was reminded today of the deep water oil spill and the CEO of BP talking about how exhausted he was after people had died. It really wasn't a good tone to set under those circumstances. So once again, it's important to validate the uncertainty of the future, but equally critical to show forward thinking. When I talk about preparing for the worst, I, want, I help companies prepare for and deal with all the what ifs. So when they happen, we can pull out those Lego, Legos and use them accordingly. Yes, they can and should be modified as we go along, but having them at the ready is really a time saver. For many of my clients, and unfortunately for many of you, we've already seen some of the worst. We've seen layoffs, furloughs, sickness, and even death among our employees and maybe our leaders. Needless to say, business interruption these days is an understatement. So it's important to prepare for every scenario so that you can pull out your Legos and use them accordingly. When it comes to tone deaf marketing, this is one of my pet peeves. I'd say to people all the time, now is not the time for marketing unless you're doing something to help the cause. If your CEO is forcing you to share happy stories about your business, but they're not related to this crisis or doing something for your community during this time, just say no. It really is not the right time. Next, communications needs a seat at the table. And this is a big one because if you are someone who's in communications and your leadership hired you for the position, you need to have a voice. The CEO should not be the loudest voice at the table, just one of them. If your company doesn't have a trusted communications person, don't wait. Now's the time to have someone at the leadership table you can trust. 
and I'm going to get into a little bit more about that later. Collaboration with legal is crucial. I learned this during my tenure at Aramark, and it's especially important for industries who know there will be lawsuits after this pandemic. You must collaborate with the legal department or your legal counsel in order to make sure you're not saying anything that's going to cause more harm at the end. And finally, under this one, I also like to say, communications is not operations and vice versa. My clients wouldn't put me on the front line and I wouldn't want the operations folks writing the messaging, but it's the collaboration among the many different departments which will save the day. When it comes to resources, it's hard to judge yourself and your own communications, really, really hard. No matter what we all say, when it comes to our own businesses, we do take it personally. Having outside eyes helps with asking the important questions that those on the inside may not have to, may not be able to think about. Outsiders can give perspective, which brings me to perspective. One of the hardest parts of my work is what I call talking leadership off the ledge. Sometimes less is more, and that's hard to tell a CEO, but it can work and it does. And you'll hear more about perspective as we go through. So I wanna talk now about talking with the team. So I, you have to understand the team, and that's what I said before. I think it's really important to consider digging deeper about who your teams are, how often they need to hear from you, what do they hear from, what do they need to hear from you? Should the messaging be translated into other languages? And I can go on and on. But to really understand the dynamic of the team will ensure that your communications are hitting them in just the right way. You have to consider what they want to hear and what they need to hear. How important are high level strategic business updates to people in your warehouse? Maybe more important than you think. Don't, us, don't underestimate everyone on the team these days. As many of you know, those with what we thought of as having the most menial jobs in the labor force have become the most critical. Who are the heroes in our trenches these days? So we want to find their stories and tell them. And what's ahead? Even if you don't know, talk about how you're thinking about the future for your operations. Also think about your communications channels. What do you have in place now and what can be added? How are you using your intranet? If you have an intranet, how are you using your website? Are you emailing people who don't have time to look at email? Are you emailing people who don't have access to computers? Are you sending texts to those who live only on texts? Have you considered a homemade video of your CEO from his or her home shared with everyone? People love them. And remember, there's still snail mail. Sometimes a piece of mail can be sent quickly to reiterate what you sent in an email or a text, which may have been read quickly and forgotten or deleted. And don't forget, it's important for the team to be able to communicate back with you as leaders. What channels do you have in place now for people to respond to you, to talk to you, to let you know how they're feeling, whether they're working at home or working in a warehouse where they feel that no one's understanding what they're going through. Operations and communications, as I said earlier, they're not the same. If you're considering how and when to reopen, communications can't make those decisions, but communications need to, needs to be at the table to help you think them through, poke holes and ask the questions that you're sure to get from the inside and out. So now let's talk a little bit more about those internal communications. Having a social media protocol now for your employees has become even more crucial. This is especially true for businesses at risk, people in the healthcare industry, nursing home industry, and others under fire these days, food processing plants, food delivery places. How, does, how your team identifies itself is important and they need to know or state what they post does not reflect the, their employer's views. If you don't have a social media protocol in place, now is the time. I'm happy to help any of you think through that. 
Number two, ensure your employees are your advocates. If you're treating your team well all the time, and especially now, they'll be your best advocates on social media and everywhere else. Take a few steps to ensure that they're on your side. My friend and former colleague, Chris Malone, wrote a book about how warmth and competency are what keeps people loyal to a brand. Never has that been more true. Warmth and competency. If you're the leader, check on the team in new ways. Show them your warmth. Pick up the phone. Call random employees just to check on them. That act of kindness, the time you spend doing that will pay itself back in dividends. It's just common courtesy. Next, honoring the heroes. There's so many heroes on your team taking the extra step, putting their lives at risk, and going the extra mile for their work in the community. Find them and honor them. We're working with a company right now that does a hero spotlight every week just to show the wider team how appreciative they are of the work. At the end of this pandemic, we plan to turn those hero stories into a book we can share with the team. So honor them now and honor them later too. But it's important that you share the good and the bad. Everyone knows that this situation is far from peaches and cream. And we've been telling our CEO clients, we need to share the bad with the good. The more your team understands your business and what it's going through, the better. Open book management may not be for everyone, but be honest in your communications and share whatever you can. This pandemic is having a trickle down impact on all of us and your employees deserve to hear that from you. When I talk about working with key stakeholders beyond the team, I'm thinking about your board of directors, your investors, your community, and if you're a nonprofit, your donors. The more they know, and the more involved you let them be, the better it is for your company or organization. Keep them all in the loop with your communications. All right, let's shift to talking about outside your company, external communications. Who's in charge? Who's in charge of communications? Is it a team? Is it one person? Is it an outside agency, a consultant? Our contingency plan set up now for leadership to be able to reach that person round the clock. If that's not in place now, it really needs to be. And are you letting that person have a voice? Once again, does the PR lead have a voice at the leadership team? They have to. This isn't about the CEO telling the communications team what to do. This is about listening, talking, disagreeing, and coming to a collaborative decision about how to handle these issues. When I start working with a company, I like to know how they've interacted with the local media and their trade media in the past. Good relationships with the media can go a long way. And I have loads of examples I'd love to share, but I can't because it's those relationships and those friendships that can make a difference when the poop hits the fan. If you're not friendly with the reporters covering you in good times, you can forget about it now. So you need to be prepared in external communications for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just as you prepared for every scenario with internal messaging, you need to do the same with how you're going to speak externally. Sure, in many cases, the messaging is going to overlap, but it's best to prepare thinking about this in advance. Will you share something differently internally than you would externally? What if an employee passes away from the virus? Would you share that person's name externally? No, but you might within the company, depending on the size of the company and how well people knew the person. These sensitivities are crucial today, especially during this fast paced news cycle. Know what you're going to say, when you're going to say it, and to whom. The next point I wanna make is using your website. Use your website to share your messaging. I've recently discovered that using the site is a good way to respond to the press 
without really responding directly to them. And I'm gonna tell you more on that in a moment. And use your social channels. They may not, this may not sound like rocket science, but these channels all serve a different purpose. Are you doing, are you doing good work in your community? Post the pictures on Instagram. Do you wanna share a case study of something your company has learned along the way in this new normal? Post it as an article on LinkedIn. Do you want to share some lighthearted company culture related to COVID-19? Post a video on TikTok. Know your audience, understand the social channel, and then use it. This is the scary slide for most people. What do you do when you get a call from the press? And I hope most of you haven't been in this situation, but this is what we're dealing with a great deal today. First and foremost, you need to have a media protocol on hand that every single employee has at their desk. It's a document that says who may and may not speak to the media. It gives guidance on how to respond to an inquiry if you aren't the spokesperson, and it will save you time when there's a crisis. If you don't have one, call me. I am happy to help with this. Um, when it comes to your media inquiries and the spokesperson, I'm one who errs on the conservative side. And I believe wholeheartedly that if you get a media inquiry, it's not because you solved world peace. So less is more. They're usually after a story that is not going to be flattering. My goal is always to protect the leader and the company's reputation, period. I don't take on clients that I feel are unethical, or doing business in a shady way. So when I'm out there protecting them, I mean it. And when it comes to media responses, you owe them nothing. When they come calling, remember that they're doing their job and it's your job to do yours. I've never given a no comment, but I certainly can do that without saying no comment. There is a strategy in responding. Sometimes, it's not responding at all. Sometimes it's giving a one, two, or three sentence statement. But just remember, when you give them a statement, you give them a story, or at least a few state sentences for them to build a story. The mantra in a newsroom is, if it bleeds, it leads. That being said, reporters aren't at your door to be your friends, they're there to get a story and you don't have to give them fuel for their fire. I recently had a case where a reporter asked me a question via email with all sorts of inaccuracies. It was my belief that she was baiting me into giving her the real numbers. I didn't take the bait. The story didn't run because she had no one to corroborate the details. Without a doubt, sometimes the most difficult thing to say is nothing. Your CEO is ranting, your COO is screaming, your investors want you to talk, they want you to tell their story. So the hardest part of my job is often convincing them that not saying anything is the win. We've had proof of that with several clients over the past six weeks, and believe me, it's, all, it's worth all the gray hair that you can't see on my head right now. Then if you see an inaccuracy, clarify it. If they get something wrong, it's your prerogative to correct it. And when I say correct it, I mean just the facts. When I send a correction, I usually send it to the reporter by email and copy his or her editor. I do it in a respectful and polite way. And I want you to know it's crucial to do that. I prefer that the leader doesn't do it. It should come from your public relations person, your communications lead, or your outside agency. Next are connections. I'm fortunate to have worked in many national and local newsrooms. Many of my dearest friends are still in those newsrooms today. I've also spent my career building up relationships with journalists who work with my clients, letting them know they'll get the truth from me when they need it, and that I understand their roles and they understand mine when and only when I need to reach out, I do. And recently, 
someone called a newsroom here in Philadelphia and made a false claim about something happening at one of my client locations. The person who made the claim told the client that they had called the TV station. So I was instantly able to call the newsroom. I actually used to work there. And, as, and I explained that the accusation was untrue. They didn't use the story. Was this a favor? Absolutely not. I had an in at the station, and because of my credibility and my friendships there, I was able to tamp down the false claim before the newsroom had to waste any of its valuable resources looking into it. It was a win for the client and a win for the newsroom staff. And once again, you're gonna see the word perspective on this slide, because as I said earlier, one of the toughest parts of what I do is talking CEOs off the ledge, helping them understand why not saying something to a reporter is often the right angle. Does it work all the time? No, nothing does. But in many instances, this one does. So now, when it's time to reopen. I put this slide in because as we think about the nation and the world reopening, we need to remember we're opening in a very new world. So I have to admit, it felt really good to think about what our new abnormal will be. So I wanna get into it and how your communications may be affected. Even writing this slide gave me a little bit of a smile because when Mike and I started talking about this presentation, we weren't even up to the reopening, rehiring, resuming phase. So number one is you have to have a plan and be sure that when that plan is constructed, that the communications team is at the table. We're entering into a new era in our lives and it's imperative that the more minds thinking through it all, the better it'll be. Your plan will be looking at what operations is doing and constructing a communications plan to accompany that. And yes, we're looking at new realities. One of my clients said to me last week, welcome to a new world. You'll probably never see a salad bar again. Think about that. That's just one little change. And think about all the others. How are we thinking about what the public, what the public will want and expect from our businesses as we reopen? How are we keeping our team safe? How are we keeping our clients and customers safe? It's a question for operations with communications at their side. And what will your audiences want to know? What will internal and external audiences demand knowing from you and your supply chain? Put yourself in the shoes of your team and your external audience and ask yourself that question again. What will they want to know? Timing. All of us live in different states and all of us have different issues related to reopening and rehiring and resuming operations. So when will you be communicating these issues? How should it, is your company nationally focused or is it focused in one state? Taking into account all of that will be important. And how will you do it? Through what channels? How will you update that channels, those channels? We've recently found that one of the best tools for a client is to have a landing page related to COVID-19 with all sorts of frequently asked questions. It answers the questions, saves the staff time in answering them individually, and they can be updated constantly. And once again, as we resume operations, we need to expect the unexpected. Needless to say, none of us turned the calendar from February to March this year, thinking we'd be living like this. So what can we anticipate moving forward? It's time to put together task forces working on all the moving pieces of reopening, rehiring, and resuming operations in whatever form they may be. Communications has to play a part in rolling out all of that. So let's just get to the, we'll wrap up with some key takeaways and then leave time for questions. Number one, communications is not operations. Operations is not communications. We need to collaborate. And as I said earlier, I put the legal team in there. Communications, operations, legal, HR, 
supply chain, everyone who's involved in your business needs to work together to make the communications valuable for those listening. Um, collaboration, as I said, is key. For those of you running businesses from home now, you know how important it is. This has to continue. Are any of you praying to the Zoom gods every day like I am? It's a total godsend. Number two, you owe the media nothing. When you get a call from the media, stop, breathe, and think. If they catch you on the phone, politely ask what they want to know, ask them to send you questions in email, and then think about how and if you want to respond. Protect your company, your leaders, and the company's reputation first. You owe them nothing, and if you need help talking a CEO off the ledge, let me know. I think it's become one of my superpowers. Number three, be as candid and transparent as you can be and show empathy. Everyone is struggling through this now in different ways, and the more the leader shows that they get it, the better. Next, allow communications to have a voice. Let them have a seat at the table, have a voice in all the discussions, please. So many companies make the mistake of allowing the leader to be the only decision maker. It's just not a good idea. Employees also need to have skin in the game. Five, perspective, it's essential. Every slide talked about perspective because it's probably the most critical element of this discussion. Having outside eyes helps provide that perspective and you're moving forward blindly if you don't have someone on the outside helping you look in. And last but not least, nothing is perfect, but we keep on trying. Even though I've shared a lot of my own best practices from years in the trenches, there's not one thing that always works. We can plan, strategize, plan some more, execute, but sometimes things don't work out as planned, so we pivot and try again. These are unprecedented times, and together we'll make it through to the other side. So thanks, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike now and see if there are any questions. Mike? Yeah, um, if anyone has any questions, there's a question box down in the bottom. We'll give it here a second to um, see if anyone has anything that, that needs answered. Um, Debbie, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. I was giggling to myself as you talked about things, um, about my time in the military and how uh, they uh, had communication. Uh, <laughs> some of the things we got had to deal with there. But, um, uh, you know, they could have definitely probably used this presentation. But um, just give it a couple more seconds here. Um, to everyone on, I will uh, shoot out a copy of the recording to everyone. Um, I'll also post it on uh, social media um, for uh, those who either didn't attend or didn't hear all of it or would like to share it with their team. Um, but uh, I don't see anything coming through. Uh, so uh, with that I being- I think that is a good sign. Yeah, right. I guess you covered everything. I mean, I thought it was, I thought you did. Um, so yeah, I've, oh wait, here we go. Got a, when communicating with internal groups, how do you prevent leaks to the media? You can't, you can't. Um, and that's why it's really important to remember that when you are talking to your internal team um, or even sharing an email with them, that that could absolutely positively get out. Um, I have a situation going on right now where um, I'm working with a nursing home and you can all imagine how dicey that is right now. We did a video um, of all of the uh, nice comments they were getting from residents' families, um, but the, re the family members had signed their names. So we did a video, we're only posting it internally at the nursing home because we didn't want um, to share it more widely in case a nasty reporter um, got a hold of it and tried to reach out to some of the residents' families. Um, they're doing everything right, but sometimes they're unkind people in the world. But no, you can't, so you have to be careful of that. Uh, good, got another one here. Um, Debbie, I love the bit about legal issues coming in the near future. 
also the bit on the salad bar. So not a question, a statement, but <laughs> very good. Um, so Debbie, I, I got a question that came to my mind when you were um, discussing, and that was, uh, how would you handle, you know, you're going to have some people uh, as we reopen, obviously small business owners, I'm sure a great deal of them want to get open. And I mean, I, I know they're sympathetic to the, um, the situation as well, but you're going to have disagreements probably internally and externally. Um, how do you go about, you know, handling that side of things when you know, like, hey, you might have, you know, 90% of the staff that's on board, 10 not, vice versa? What, what are your thoughts around that? Well, the very first slide, I think the very first line I have is that leadership matters. And I believe completely in collaboration. But um, when when push comes to shove, the leader is the one who's going to have to make the final decision. And, you know, you could have a small business where everyone's just dying to get back to work and, you know, they want to be together and they need the money and all that. But if the leader decides that it is just unsafe in some reason, in, for some way for them not to be together, the leader has the final say. Good. I've um, got another question come in and says, any suggestion on how to build key messages for quick lines, media queries, what to say when we have little information and many calls from journalists? I probably need a little bit more information and I would ha be happy to have that person give me a call and I could talk them through it. Um, what you really need to know is what the journalists are looking for and then think about what you want to say. And you have to just start with a blank screen and start writing it down and then honing it, honing it, honing it. So you're not sharing more than you need to share and that everyone can look at it from operations, from legal, from communications, from HR, and make sure that what you're saying is not gonna be um, detrimental to you if it's public. And I'm happy to talk to someone about that offline. I think the question was a little vague for me to answer. Um, when you discussed homemade CEO videos, how do you recommend you work with the CEO? A script, talking points, free form, and how to prep the CEO for the video dry runs? Great, great question. Um, I, it depends on the CEO. So I have two that I'm working with now where I've written out entire scripts for them and I've had to walk them through how to videotape themselves on an iPhone. Um, it's only slightly easier than teaching my 85 year old mother how to do <laughs> Zoom. So um, in, in these cases though, I think, I, I think every one of us who has logged into anything and has, have seen celebrities at home can appreciate that team members want to see their CEOs in their living room. And mm -hmm. so there are ways to talk them through it. Hopefully in some houses, they don't have to hold the phone up. There's someone living there with them, but um, I've worked with CEOs who can do it from uh, uh, talking points and I've worked with CEOs who need a full script. So it really depends on your CEO and how that person um, will will manage best. Yeah, good. I'm a fan of the real. Um, so uh, I like seeing videos from, you know, all kinds of people who, uh, you know, it just looks real. Like, hey, give me my phone, grab a Zoom camera and uh, and record something. It looks, it looks genuine. It looks good. Um, so I know I'm a fan of that too. Yeah, especially today. I saw Matthew McConaughey today yeah. on the Today Show. He looked as ragged as the rest of us, I hate to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a black market haircut this weekend. So. <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> um, one more, how do you balance desire to communicate with internal audiences about plans, et cetera, with, with the fear of those leaks? A lot of collaboration. Um, I am, as Mike said in the, as in the beginning, I'm the president of a board of directors of a nonprofit, and we talk. We talk and talk and talk, and we try to figure out, you know, what we want to say and how we want to say it, knowing that everything we say internally has the potential to go external. And I think now is not the time for us to be hiding from each other. We all are in the same boat in a lot of ways. And right now, um, the more we say, without harming any people, the better it is. Your 
team members want to feel like they are a part of what's happening. And I think what people want to know now, employees want to now know now more than ever is, is my leadership thinking ahead? Um, I know uh, as being the parent of a college student, I want to know what the university is thinking of for the fall. Um, as a parent who's sending a kid to camp, they want to know, is camp happening this summer? People who, you know, have vacation plans, what's going on with the airline? So um, th now is the time to be a little more transparent than maybe we've been in the past, but there are a lot of things to take into account. And I am just a big proponent of having teams talk it out together, um, changing each other's minds and really um, using perspective when making the final decision. Good, good, those are good questions. Thanks, thanks everyone for uh, sending those in. Um, if uh, Debbie, if you don't have anything else, um, I'm gonna go ahead and end this. And uh, as I mentioned before everyone, I will be sending out a copy of the recording. Debbie, thank you very much. Very super informative, um, enjoyed every bit of it. And uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. All right, take care everyone, stay safe. Stay safe.